for those who don't know, SpongeBob is about this uh, sea sponge who lives in a place called Bikini Bottom, and he's this really zany uh, type of character. He he almost be- feels like he belongs in the Looney Tunes gang, to be honest. Uh, but he's completely aloof, and he does not understand how much people don't like him. Uh, <laughs> and he's got all his friends. Squidward is his next door neighbor, who uh, is the antithesis of him. He completely like abhors his own life, and the only thing he finds joy in is doing art and playing the clarinet really poorly. <laughs> this poor guy. I feel like Squidward is meant to be an artist. All that inner turmoil. <laughs> And self-loathing, it's perfect, don't you think? It's genius. I, I think that, I bet you that was in their series Bible when they came up with the character. <laughs> like, this is who he is. He, he should be this downtrodden artist. <laughs> so anyway, SpongeBob apparently was in one of Squidward's art classes at one point, Jordan? Yeah, so it's been a while since I've seen the episode, but from what I remember, Squidward sets up an art class and SpongeBob is the only one uh, who attends the class. And he's like, oh, shoot, I don't want to teach SpongeBob, but it gives me something to do. I mean, all right, whatever. And uh, everything that Spon- I'm sorry, Squidward tries to teach him, SpongeBob excels at, like, for absolutely no reason. So, uh, the, so one example is where Squidward's trying to show SpongeBob how to draw a perfect circle. And he does it, and it's kind of squiggly, much like how most of us would draw a circle. And then SpongeBob's like, oh, how's, how's this? He holds up a perfect circle. He's like, okay, do it again. That's impossible. That's not, how, how do you even do that? He's like, okay, well, first I draw this head. He draws this completely refined, like Andrew Loomis style head. <laughs> and then he's like, let me erase some of the detail features. And he you know, scribbles. And then he stops for a second. And then he's like, one, two, three. And it turns into a perfect circle. And he's just like, forget it. I don't even. <laughs> but remember, Jordan, <laughs> along the way, it turns into an Andrew Loomis drawing. Right, yes, yes. Which us Andrew art nerds can appreciate, right? I, I do appreciate that. And it's, I feel like it's one of those Easter eggs for artists who are watching the episode. Like, hey guys, you recognize this? You recognize this? <laughs> That's what I mean is I always suspected when I watched SpongeBob that there were some hidden Easter eggs in the show because... Come on, how many people watching this episode are going to say, that's from Andrew Loomis? Like, I just love that they hid that in this episode. It's genius. The writers from, like, 1999, 2004, absolute genius. It's really, really good. Okay, so we got SpongeBob's Circle. But we're going to actually focus on the self-portraits that Squidward made. Because you know what? There's a lot of them. Oh my goodness, Squidward, really, really productive artist, which I have to say, Jordan, that's a really important part of being an artist is knowing how to be productive, knowing to make many, many iterations. I have to say from that point of view, I'm very impressed with Squidward's work ethic. What do you think? Yeah, Yeah, I agree. Um, I think that he would, just his sheer desire would blow most art students out of the water, you know, because he puts in that effort. Now, in terms of the quality of his pieces, we'll get to that in a little bit. But um, there's something about that drive that is actually very admirable about Squidward that I can't take. I can't take that away from him. He's already got everything else taken away. <laughs> wow. It seems like people really know SpongeBob well. This is like a new thing for me. Like, I didn't realize how much people liked SpongeBob. But I guess if you grow up with it... There's that whole nostalgia thing. Sterling Richards wants to know, does Squidward work from a mirror or a photo? All right, well, you know, we did that stream last week about can you tell if it was from a photo or from life? So, Jordan, do you think Squidward uses photo references? Um, I, I've never seen a camera in SpongeBob, <laughs> so I'm going to Probably would break because it's all underwater, right? They might have some sort of special device because they do have TVs, but um, I don't know. I assume they're from life because some of the paintings that he does are just a little too abstract, like this Picasso style one uh, here. You know, that if he's looking in the mirror and seeing that, then there's clearly something wrong with either him or the mirror. Uh, That's all I'm going to (laughs) say. I don't know. See, I get the feeling like we're looking at this one here, which is just this giant dome of Squidward self-portraits. I get the feeling that he's a really 
experimental artist, that he's pretty impulsive, and that he's willing to try anything. So I suspect that he does a little bit of both because he's got a couple compositions in here that feel like snapshots. It's almost like so in your face that I sort of can't believe that those are done from life. But then he also has some compositions where it's got that, I call it the art school self-portrait, you know, that stare <laughs> that everybody <laughs> learns to paint in art school. So I oh, sort of yeah. feel like it's both. It could be. I don't, I don't know. You know, I just noticed there's one of the photos we, I think we put above. There's like three of the same painting in the shot. <laughs> I just I just had to comment on that. I just thought it was funny. Uh, Salty yeah, person no. is telling us, don't try and logic the SpongeBob universe. You will fail. <laughs> you know what? That salty person's actually right. <laughs> That's true, because there's talk. a lot of things that do not make sense. Like I was watching an episode with my kids once. And there was like fire. <laughs> oh, you haven't have you seen the campfire episode? <laughs> so what about composition, Jordan? Because he's got, first of all, a lot of self-portraits. How is he doing in terms of composition? Do you think his compositional skills are good or does he need to work on it? Uh, for the most part, everything is really centered. Uh, and that's something that usually we would not recommend when you're creating a piece. Now, I said this before, if you're trying to create something that is meant to bring attention to itself, like a throne or a palace or something like that, then maybe putting it in the center is, is fine. Uh, but almost everything he does is like dead center, dead center, dead center. And I feel like he could branch out more. It's clear he has the ability to do that. I just don't think he recognizes that. I'm not really sure how to put it. Well, so we're looking at this one. I didn't see this episode, but it looks like he stabbed his painting with a violin bow. I don't know. I didn't I, see this episode, but maybe it's a work in progress. Who knows? But I have to say, I, that's an awful lot of wasted background. And I'm always getting on you guys about ignoring your backgrounds and spending too much time on your figure. And that's exactly what he's doing. He's not making the painting cohesive. Like, you really should be thinking Squidward about getting every part of your piece to progress at the same rate. Otherwise, your composition is going to end up looking really fragmented. I mean, come on. He needs to think about these things. If you're going to wear the whole, I'm struggling so hard, you, you got to be thinking about these things, don't you think? Yeah, you know, th this this idea of Skoward's art is very, it's very self-centered. He does a lot of, just everything he does pretty much himself but there's also a self-deprecation to it that's that's really kind of sad. And if I remember correctly, that that episode where you know the the bow is stabbed, I actually think that was SpongeBob or Patrick's fault, if I remember correctly. And <laughs> that's so I sad. I, I, I don't know what they were doing, but somehow just like flung over there. If some, if I'm wrong, you guys can correct me in the comments because it's been a while. But um, but there's something about his artwork that just you know reeks of just this this sadness. If he's really trying to figure out why his life isn't going the way that it is but he also feels like he's so amazing you know it's it's this weird kind of dichotomy but you don't you here. think jordan that sort of describes every artist you know because i feel like all these streams that we're doing like we did a stream the other day about being jealous of other artists okay and let me tell you i have problems with jealousy of other artists that i've never been able to get over so it's sort of this funny I don't know, combination of self-loathing, but also to be an artist, you have to believe that you have something to say, right? Yeah. And so part of you yeah. has to have a certain degree of confidence in yourself as a person and, and wanting to say something. Don't you think that fits Squidward perfectly? Yeah, you know, I actually have a friend of mine who called, uh, who taught me, it's called the Dunning-Kruger effect, which is basically the idea that you think you're better than you actually are. And I think Squidward is like, a textbook case of that because <laughs> no one appreciates his work. And there's uh, one piece that we're going to look at a little bit later where someone says something very insulting about his work. I won't spoil it right now. We'll get into it in a minute. But um, it's very sad, actually. <laughs> Neil is saying Squidward should watch the Art Prof portrait composition stream. You're right, Neil, because I talk about some really cool portrait compositions in here. Now, granted, Squidward's not doing that bad because actually one thing that I see very often in a lot of my classes is 
I'll ask students, oh, do uh, 12 thumbnail sketches. And I want the compositions to be really dynamic. And I want you to really explore lots of possibilities. But I can't tell you how many students I've had who come in, all 10 sketches look exactly the same. So these compositions, I don't think they're great compositions, but you got to give him some credit that they are different. And also the fact that they're different proportions of rectangles, like in this one where he's like walking through a door, there's like a really tall portrait painting. And then there's like square mm -hmm. ones. Like he, he's working with all these different sizes. And I think that's sort of fun because a lot of people use that same standard rectangle that we're so used to seeing. And I think that's pretty cool that he did that. All right, let's take a look, actually. You know, you know who I actually thought about, you guys, for Squidward? Squidward should look at Rembrandt, okay? Because Rembrandt is probably the artist who is most known for self-portraits. And he painted them throughout his entire life. I'm not just saying he did a few. It's like he was painting them when he was like 25. And then he was doing them right up until his death. So what's really remarkable about these Rembrandt paintings is that they're not just a commentary on him as a person, but you also watch his technique develop as he goes along. And they're, they're just an incredible documentation of a single person's life. And don't you sort of think that's what Squidward's doing? It's just like multiple iterations <laughs> of yeah, himself. You know, like, here's me upset, here's me mad. It's like, there's so much emotion in there. Yeah, I mean, he's been painting himself for, you know, 21 years, so he's probably not too far off from Rembrandt, <laughs> if you really think about it. All right, let's move on to Bold and Brash, which is this painting here. It's a pretty small piece. It looks like it's on a stretched canvas. I'm wondering if he stretched that canvas himself. It's a little hard to see. It doesn't look like he used a staple gun, but let's see if it's we like can get nails. a closer view and take a look at that. So Jordan, can you explain Bold and Brash to everybody? Um, if I remember correctly, Bold and Brash was just, you know, his, uh, his, I don't want to say magnum opus, but it was a piece that he's really impressed with. And uh, he wanted to show this art uh, critic who was supposed to come by. And um, this is the part where I said I would leave till later. He said, and I quote, it belongs in the trash. So that's that's how he felt about SpongeBob. I'm sorry, Squidward's artwork, um, which is really sad to hear. Um, that's unfortunate. But, it's know. really a bummer. I mean, I think I believe in constructive criticism, but that's just really mean. Like, yeah. although I have to say, I taught at an art school where there was one professor who was famous for having said that to a student at one point. They actually said to the student, "I know what you're going to do after this critique." You're going to put it in the trash, aren't you? It's like, yikes. <laughs> That's not helpful. But you know something, Jordan? I find that when you get out of art school and you encounter curators and gallery directors and people like that who are not invested in your education at all, they do say a lot of useless things that are not fun to listen to. Like I had a curator actually say to me about one of my sculptures. She said, I don't care for this at all. I'm like, oh. okay, <laughs> okay. <laughs> that's it? <laughs> Could you, no, that was it. She had nothing else to say. So while she did not tell me it belonged in the trash, she did tell me something pretty useless when you think about it. That's always the worst. It's, it's one thing to get really good feedback. Like yeah, everyone's like, oh, I love it. I think that was fantastic. Great ideas here, here, here. And it's another thing to go like, okay, you have... 25 issues with this piece. We're going to address each one of these right now. And it's very harsh. But when someone says nothing, really, they don't even, there's no, uh, no weight on the scale either, or that hurts the most, you know, like Wilson is saying Squidward throughout the entire episode is so non-expressive. The faces he makes in the paintings of himself are the most you ever really see Squidward express himself ever. and yeah. makes so much sense. Oh, so maybe the interpretation, Wilson, is that the paintings are the only place he can be who he really is? Is that what it is, Jordan? Does that make sense? Yeah, you know, I mean, he stacks all of the, the paintings in the same room. Uh, and I think it's also his music room as well. So that's like his, his solace. That's his 
freedom place, you know, or, or you know. Heliod space, space. is saying, I think it's a representation of himself showing that he is bold. He's both brash, hating himself and bold, describing his confidence like what you were saying. Hey, that's a pretty good title. And when you describe it like that, actually, I mean, as artist titles go, that's a pretty good one. There's a lot of really annoying artist titles out there that just really get on my nerves. But Bold and Brash, it's, it's very cut to the chase, and yet you can interpret it how you want. I don't know. Do you like artist titles, Jordan? Everybody has such different concepts about titles and I, whether they I, matter. I almost never title the stuff I work on. Um, unless I'm really inspired by something, I usually just kind of leave it. I'm like, yeah, that's not the best at picking my own titles, to be honest. <laughs> Let's see, Glennon Inc. is saying, what do you think about how his canvas is stretched? Okay, let's talk about that. I'm going to cover this, Jordan, because last I checked, you don't stretch a lot of canvases. <laughs> Not very much, no. Take it away. So let's look at it up close. Okay, I'm going to guess that it's pre... That it's... I think he stretched it himself, but here's the problem, guys, okay? You don't want to cut your canvas that tight to the edge of the stretcher bar because if you ever had to take the canvas off the stretcher bars and restretch it, you'd have very little extra canvas to help you out. So actually when I stretch canvases, I leave like a lot extra on the side because I know that, oh, if I ever have to remove it, it's gonna be a lot easier. Whereas if you cut it like right, like an inch next to the image, it can actually become problematic as far as the conservation goes. Um, Jordan, what do you think about the color scheme? The colors, um, they're very much in the, you know, aqua, cyan, yellow families, very analogous color scheme, um, which actually now I think about it, it actually matches his clothing pretty well. He's got this like, yellowish brown shirt and the skin color, is supposed, it's supposed to be him. So, um, you know, that doesn't really bother me. I just feel like the tone is a little too similar. Um, the overall value structure, like the, the yellow is almost at the, uh, the same spot as the blue. You see what I'm saying? Does that make sense? Well, here's so. the thing. Like one technique that I do, if I want to check the contrast of something I'm making, is I'll just take a photo of it, even just in my phone, I'll make it a black and white image. And I'll look at it and say, okay, do I have a full range of values? Do I have the darkest dark? Do I have multiple grays? Do I have a bright highlight? And if we put brash and bold into Photoshop, it's a pretty gray painting, don't you think? Yeah, there's nothing that really pops. And it's kind of sad because individually, I think those colors would pop. You know, that yellow, I think by itself, that definitely would get a reaction. Or even the bluish green, you know, turquoise color, that would also pop. But when they're combined together like this, um, especially when you have a more graphic piece, it's not meant to be like super realistic. I think it ends up weakening, weakening it. And I think uh, one of those could have been pushed a little bit more, probably the, the turquoise. And actually, I really wish that he pushed the dimensionality of the left leg because you were pointing out to me earlier that you can actually see like little tiny blue suction cups on the left leg in the figure. And now see, that's very important because that shows the three-dimensional twisting of that form. Whereas if you look at the positioning of the right leg, okay, that's a very flat looking pose. And so I think he really should have thought about overlap and about thinking across the form instead of keeping it so flat. I don't know. That's sort of disappointing to me that he didn't take advantage of that shift of texture in the suction cups. Yeah, I, I agree. <laughs> I, I think, you know, I, I also think just the, the line of action too could use so much more exaggeration. You know, like, like you said, if that leg were just kind of pushed down a little bit and you get like a nice C curve or S curve going on because it's supposed to be bold and brash. And those are two very dynamic words. They're very quick. They're very sharp, very big words. And I feel like it's almost like, oh, I'm not going to be bold and brash anymore. I'm just going to kind of go straight up and down. Um, now, he does look like he's doing a little Charlie Brown dance, uh, the one with the guys like. Yeah, where know, they're like moving head. their heads back yeah, and forth. Guy, <laughs> I can't remember. That. That's kind of what it feels like Squidward's painting is doing. Vaporistic is saying, look at the orange background, the light concentrated at the top of the canvas, the brightest at the nose, which is a significant feature of Squidward. 
That's true, but I think he could have done better with the lighting. Don't you think? The lighting's a little bit dim, and I don't know. He doesn't have a very good handle on reflected light. Yeah, I'm, I'm not really convinced that that was an intentional thing, because on the right side of the canvas where his hand's kind of covering up, it's just as bright. And reflective light wouldn't be that bright compared to the natural, like, the source of that light. Um so I don't know. I, I feel like he's kind of just shooting from the hip a little bit. <laughs> By the way, we should talk about weight distribution in the figure, us being big anatomy nerds, right? Because it bothers me that he's just floating. Like, there's no sense of gravity. There's no context for him. I mean, Lauren is saying in the chat that she loves the painterly background. But the thing is, the painterly background to me, it just feels like a backdrop. Like, I wish he would contextualize the figure. Don't you think that would work better? Yeah, you know, I, I I noticed that it's something he's not afraid to do because, like, a lot of his other artwork that we've seen uh, has a really funky, like, pattern or something like that. And, again, I think it would contribute to the whole idea of bold and brash. Uh, and here it just um, – I know Squidward's very much into himself. He's got the Dunn Kruger effect thing going on. But he could take a couple minutes to paint something other than himself in the situation and just get something that really – uh, push the the boundaries in, in that way. So do you think that the self-portrait is his comfort zone and he's afraid to explore anything else? Is there anything that we've seen that hasn't been a self-portrait in this stream? I actually don't think there has Well, I think been. we saw that sculpture that he made for the guy that commissioned it. Although I wasn't, we weren't going to focus on that necessarily, but let me pull up the image of the sculpture. Oh, no, wait, this is the one where he made it out of the block. <laughs> In like three seconds, like he just hit the chisel and it just came down. But I feel like I have a picture of that sculpture somewhere. Let's see. This one. This giant one that I think was commissioned by, I don't know if it was a restaurant owner. Somebody in the chat should see if they can oh, figure Price. out how this sculpture got commissioned. So he's not totally only painting himself, but you're right. Maybe he's resting on his laurels. Maybe he's just not asking more of himself as an artist and you have to start to push yourself as an artist got to get outside of that comfort zone don't you think oh def i get told that all the time and it it uh it's a very uncomfortable conversation to be totally honest with you all but it's something that's necessary if you want to grow as an artist ripple of aqua says i'm surprised for a piece that's titled with impact words like bold and brash he has such a soft painting himself a soft background the only thing maybe bold is the yellow background yeah you know it's like he didn't think through a range of textures because i don't know is he a squid he's a squid right mm -hmm. so do squids have skeletal structures i don't think they do not that i know of um Someone in the chat, you guys have access to Google. <laughs> well <laughs> you guys can tell us but see that makes me wonder though okay if he's a squid maybe he needs to take advantage of some of the translucency that you see in the skin of squids. Now that would be cool because then he could get some oil medium, one part gams, no, one part linseed oil, one part stand oil, three parts gamsol, and he could do a glaze. And then he could get some really beautiful translucency because right now the painting is so opaque. Like he does not have the range that I would expect to see in an oil painting. Yeah, no, that's a good point. I would love to see the translucency. That would be awesome. Yeah, and don't they have, I don't know, I feel like the squids that I've seen, they have little speckles. Like Squidward has these little dots on his head. Or are those yeah. supposed to be hair? I don't know. <laughs> I haven't uh, watched a lot of Spongebob. <laughs> I don't think we want to know the answer to that one. <laughs> um, and by the way, you guys, I have to say another thing that he should work on which one of our tutorials would help him. So, so Squidward, if you're listening, just go to the Art Prof YouTube channel, go to the character design tutorials playlist, and Squidward, I think you would really learn something from Kat Huang's tutorial because what I really like about Kat's character design tutorial, she actually inks her character design with a quill pen and in India ink, which a lot of people don't like to do because it's really hard to control. It's easy to spill the ink and make a big mess. But, oh, my God, the line work that Kat gets from that quill pen, it's so elegant. And you could not get that in Photoshop. So if we go back and we look at Bold and Brash, do you see how the line is just the same line over and over again? Like, he never increases the width of it. 
He never makes it really thin. It's just the same thing over and over again. Yeah, it's very monotonous. Um, you know, especially, uh, it, you know, he could definitely thicken up those lines, especially in the parts where the shadow would be, like under the, uh, the I guess, the feet, tentacles, you know, whatever. Um, and where the, the nose and, you know, the back of the head and all those places, I think that would instantly make this uh, much better. Heliade is saying, maybe you guys could recreate it with all of your suggestions executed. I see a lot of people redoing it, but not adding on to it, just copying it. So I think it would be cool to see that, I guess. That's an interesting suggestion. And you know what, Jordan, you can totally disagree with me, but here's my feeling. I see a lot of tutorials on YouTube where people submit something to the YouTube artist and the YouTube artist corrects it for them. See, I have sort of a fundamental problem with that because I don't think I'm there to correct anybody. I think I can make suggestions and say, think about this. But it's sort of like, have you guys ever, tell me in the chat, have you ever been in an art class where the art teacher just took your pencil and just drew all over your drawing without asking permission? Has that ever happened to you, Jordan? <laughs> you know, one of the first times I did figure drawing, <laughs> um, I was I was trying the best I could. And my teacher, he came by and drew on my page, not on my drawing, but on my page. And he circled around the room and he came back and he said, oh, this one came out pretty good. I was like, you, you drew that. <laughs> <laughs> oh my gosh, that's so embarrassing for the teacher. Yeah, he was like, oh. And looking back, maybe I should have said that just to save him the embarrassment, but that's what happened. And I got much better over time. You know, uh, I, I changed my mind about that, Jordan, because I think in the beginning I thought, oh, well, that's the quickest, fastest way to get my point across is to just draw whatever it is that I think they should draw. But then I really started thinking about it. I was like, you know, your drawing is such a personal space. And I feel like that's sort of a violation. So even if somebody says, yeah, that's OK, you can draw on my drawing. I feel like they're going to say that because I'm the teacher. And so they're sort of in a position to not say no. And honestly, if I can't describe it to somebody, without drawing on the drawing, then I think it, the problem is with me as a teacher that I'm not able to thoroughly demonstrate. So what I do now with students is I just draw on the side. Like I'll say, is it okay if I draw a little something here, but I won't actually draw on the drawing. So I don't know if that answers your question. Um, I'm sorry, I forget who asked that, but that's just something that I feel really strongly about. Wow, God, you guys have a lot of stories about this. PJ says, I had a professor who did that. If we gave him permission, he walked us through it. So it helped a bit. But at the same time, to an extent, I feel the drawing wasn't entirely mine anymore. Annie is saying tracing paper. Yeah, tracing paper is a great option because then you can just put it on, say what you're talking about. A lot of illustrators use that, especially when they're just trying to run through a lot of different options. And salty person is saying, yep, we feel pressured to say yes. The teacher asks those kinds of things. My chronic says, yes, a teacher drew on my sketchbook without asking permission. That's not cool. I feel like a sketchbook, it's its almost like a diary. Like that's a really personal space. What do you think, Jordan? Yeah, I. there are times where people ask me for help for, on drawing something like like the 2500 drawings. And I'll always ask them, like, is it cool if I draw here or, do you need, or should I get another piece of paper? I'll just let you keep it. And I'll give them the choice. And... Uh, I think that's always much better uh, than just assuming that you can do that. It's sort of like taking someone's car keys and assuming you can drive it just because you're friends. You know, it's like, no, that's kind of my personal thing. Like, I'll be happy to give you a ride, but no, no. <laughs> you know what it's like for me? It's like if somebody comes to my house, you know, these people, they just start helping themselves to anything that's in your kitchen. You're like, oh, OK, you couldn't ask. Yeah. <laughs> it's just a little bit uh, not so nice. Let's see. Annie's saying the worst is when they look in the sketchbook without permission. Oh, that's not cool. I feel like that's like looking at somebody's diary, right? Because you don't know what's in that sketchbook, that maybe there are certain areas that they don't want you to see. Yeah, for sure. Um, all right. Another thing I was thinking, Jordan, because Squidward has some emotions. He's got some stuff he's got to deal with. Like, look at this horrible, sad picture of him. He's like sitting all curled up. And then this one, this is really sad where he like has this art show and then like nobody buys his stuff and he gets like really upset. It's like really, really sad. So I think Squidward, you should check out our artist wellness playlist 
because being an artist is not just making work. A lot of it is your mindset, how you feel about things. I mean, we did the stream about jealousy the other day where Alex, Eloise, and I confessed to all of our dark, evil thoughts about other artists. Of course, Alex was like, here's the solution. And Eloise and I were like, what solution? <laughs> but Jordan, do you want to say a quick thing about that? Because I think that being an artist is challenging to begin with, but all these emotions. I mean, Squidward is right to feel all these things, don't you think? Yeah, and, and that, that's part of um, what I think makes critiquing or receiving a critique so difficult at the beginning uh, is because you, it's hard to separate yourself from your own artwork. And uh, and sometimes, this is how I felt when I first started getting like very serious critiques in art school, uh, it felt like they were talking about me as a person. Like, what do you mean my ideas aren't good? What do you mean? You know, and I would tend to get very defensive. Um, that still creeps up from time to time, but I've learned to deal with it much more. And it's just an adjustment into thinking it's not you. It's just we want to help your artwork to improve. We want you to be better. We want you to be successful. Um, and Squidward, I think, needs some maybe a couple therapy sessions. Uh, he should not be getting as frustrated with his work as he is. And I, I feel bad for the guy. Um, I sort of get the art sale thing, though, because I had a former student who said that they went to one of those like zine book events where like everybody has a booth and you, you put out your zines and it's like really fun and everything. And they said that after the event, they were so depressed because they sat next to their friend who just sold out like everything. And they said they just watched all day, just people walking past him and going to their friend's booth. And he didn't sell a thing. And he was like, I was so low after that event. So I sort of feel for him. I mean, on one hand, I feel like, yes, you have to deal with resilience and you have to deal with jealousy and rejection and all these things. And it's normal and healthy to feel those things. But at a certain point, you can't let that totally drag you down because oh my gosh, if I had a dollar for every time I was rejected, wow, I could send my kids to school like one of those expensive schools because <laughs> it's happened so much. <laughs> yeah. It's, Bad Baristic is saying being a cashier with a stingy boss and a coworker that is always positive that you hate, but you kind of want to be like that. It must have been a very pressurized bikini bottom life. That's true, Jordan, because he hates his job, doesn't he? He hates everything. The only thing he doesn't hate is the clarinet and his artwork. That's pretty much it. And then there was one time he did pretty well at the concert uh, in one of the episodes in like 2002, I think, or 2001, something like that. You guys know what I'm talking about. But that's it. He's like a pretty pessimistic guy, just naturally. Zoe is saying, I had the impression that Squidward just wants to prove himself in his craft, but always ends up getting beaten by SpongeBob, who's the accidental genius. In the end, he tries too hard, but no one cares. That's so sad. You know what this makes me think of? It makes me think of that play Amadeus. Salieri is so jealous of Mozart because Mozart is so good and everything's so easy for him. It's sort of like that. It's like everybody has that, I don't know, that foil or something that's going against them. <laughs> Guys, if you create some artwork from one of our tutorials or one of our videos, we want to see it. In fact, we would like to give you guys a shout out in one of our YouTube videos. So I would recommend you go to artprof.org and you click on tutorials and project ideas and it's gonna take you to what we are calling Artprof Share. It's a submission form. You upload an image, you tell us what you learned, what your experience was like, because I just am like gushing with pride when people tell me that they learned something from our videos. It's just the most amazing thing. The other thing you can do is if you wanted to show us, you don't have to submit if you don't want the shout out, something more casual. You can just tag us on Instagram at art.prof. Just use hashtag artprofshare. And then you guys can really see what other people are making from our tutorials because there's been some really, really cool stuff. But it's also cool to get a YouTube shout out as well. So anyway, hope you guys will consider that. Please come hang out with us on Discord. I always go to Discord after the live streams. And so we're having a lot of fun in there. There are some pretty funny comparisons. Like we have figured out that Jordan looks like Frank Ocean and a couple other people. If you guys want to know who that is, join us in Discord. The link 
is in the video description below. Please come hang out with us at artprof.org. Check out lots of free resources there. Subscribe to our channel and join the Art Prof family because we're like super nice and supportive and encouraging, unlike 80% of the internet. <laughs> Although people are nicer now, I think because of the pandemic. I think people have cut back. I read that the murder rate has actually gone down <laughs> since the lockdown, which is very terrible. I mean, it's good that that's happened, but it's, it's interesting. So anyway, guys, thank you so much to our top Patreon supporters. You guys make this possible. Thank you to everybody for your wonderful, thoughtful comments about the artistic mind of Squidward. Everybody stay safe. We will see you next time. Bye.